In a lot of testimonies we hear uh, at this convention, we listen very carefully for what took place inside a person's mind that got them starting to leave the watchtower. Sometimes we can pin it down, sometimes it's difficult to pin down, but those who still have a relative or a friend in the organization or those who are talking to Jehovah's Witnesses always want to know, what is it, what triggers the change in the mind? What's the first step? Well, for many people, the first step is the thought that, well, it's God's organization, but there's something wrong with it. Uh, It's God's organization, but it's gone corrupt. It's God's organization, but maybe the men at the top uh, aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Maybe, maybe there's a problem up there. Now, in my own case, I began thinking back in uh, between 1979 and 1981, in that time period, I began thinking that it was the local elders in my area that were corrupt, but Brooklyn was okay. Well, I was right about the local elders. Uh, I became an elder myself in the mid-1970s. I was an elder for eight years and a witness for 13 years. And um, I was one who wasn't too observant when I was just a member of the congregation, but when I became an elder, I began to find out what was really going on. And I saw how um, if a, uh, a young black person in the congregation smoked one or two cigarettes, they were disfellowshipped the next week. Uh, a white girl who was a daughter of a friend of an elder smoked and smoked and smoked, and it went on for a couple of years. And every time the subject was brought up, uh, the elders would say, yes, we have to meet about that. We have to do something about that. But it never happened. And I saw many, many things of that sort go on within the organization. One of the problems that I had was with young people that I was bringing into the organization. Between my wife and myself, we got 25 people baptized as Jehovah's Witnesses. We both pioneered part of the time, and we were very active in field service. But I reached a point where I was bringing young men to the Kingdom Hall, and uh, these young men would come in their blue jeans and T-shirts and uh, ponytails and beards, goatees and whatnot, and they'd look around and see everybody in the 1950s haircut. And if nobody, if if they didn't just notice it themselves, somebody would come up and tell them that this they weren't going to be acceptable to God unless they conformed and uh, took on an outward appearance that would be pleasing to God. Well, I realized there was something wrong with that because many of these young men wanted to become Jehovah's Witnesses. They believed it was the truth, and they thought they wanted to serve God, but this was put up as such an obstacle to them that they would turn around and not come back to the Kingdom Hall. Well, I realized that I wasn't the only one who felt that way because we had a Bethel speaker at that time, a special speaker from Brooklyn, uh, Colin Quackenbush, who used to be the editor of the Awake magazine. And he spoke at a special assembly up in the Boston area. And at this special assembly, in front of the whole audience, all the congregations that gathered together, uh, he said, you elders are driving the young people away from the truth. He said, you're imposing rules of dress and grooming that are not scriptural, they're not in the Bible, and you're going beyond what's written, and as a result, you're driving the young people away from the truth. So I thought, after hearing that talk, that this represented the viewpoint of the governing body, and I thought the local elders were going against Brooklyn in this particular matter. So when the local elders stopped a young Bible student who had a goatee from going out in field service and told him he had to cut off his goatee first, I decided to start fighting the elders on this and to stick up for what I thought was the governing body's position in Brooklyn. Well, during this time, the uh, circuit overseer, we had a new circuit overseer who had come from Brooklyn, and this particular man uh, selected me as his sort of right-hand man in the congregation. Now, I didn't realize what was going on at first, but it was a political type of thing. This particular circuit overseer was used to the power politics of Bethel, and in each congregation in the circuit, he selected an elder as his right-hand man in that congregation. So that worked fine. He didn't care, you know, what my haircut looked like. I, I decided to try to help some of these young men to come into the congregation by wearing my own hair a little bit over the years, not like it is now. That would have got me thrown out immediately, but uh, just a little bit so they would feel more comfortable when they came to the meetings. 
And he said that was fine. He, he didn't have a problem with that. If some of the elders uh, had a problem, well, that, that was uh, their problem. But then the circuit overseer tried to use me uh, as his political henchman in the congregation, his right-hand man, and he wanted me to go after an elderly brother who was in his 70s. And this elderly brother uh, was missing the meetings of the circuit overseer and the elders when the circuit overseer came to town. And the circuit overseer told me to go give this brother strong counsel because he has to come and show his respect to the organization by coming to this meeting uh, with the circuit overseer. And I said to the circuit overseer, I said, well, you know, Brother uh, Palkins, he's an elderly brother and he uh, has quite a lot of wisdom and experience and I think he can make his own decision whether to come to these meetings or not. He has heart trouble and he probably knows best whether he should come. The circuit overseer said, no, no, you have to tell him. Well, I refused to carry out his orders. And from that moment on, he just reversed his position. I wasn't his right-hand man. Rather, I was the one he was going to try to get rid of in the congregation. So the uh, haircut that didn't bother him before became the excuse for calling me up before uh, an instant committee, an instant meeting, uh, with no notice whatsoever. I was just told to go downstairs and walked in and found this whole thing set up with witnesses testifying against me and uh, elders and, and whatnot. Now, at that particular time, my wife Penny had also started wearing pantsuits to the meeting. Uh, the reason she did that was because of a student that she was studying with. She had a very intelligent young woman that she was studying with who was starting to come to meetings. And this young woman said, uh, well, you know, I'm not acceptable there. If I come in pants, everybody has a dress on. And Penny said, well, that's ridiculous. You, you know, that shouldn't be an obstacle. Um, she suggested the woman uh, could wear whatever she wanted to wear when she came to the meetings. And, of course, the student said, well, if that's true, then why don't you wear pants? Well, Penny didn't know how to answer that, so she said, well, it, it is true, so I'll go ahead and I'll wear a pantsuit, too, and then you'll feel more comfortable. Well, that worked out all right. In fact, when the two of them showed up at the Kingdom Hall the next week, some elderly sisters who had varicose veins started wearing pantsuits, and it was uh, it was winter time, and some of the older sisters thanked Penny for making it possible for them to wear pantsuits to the Kingdom Hall. Well, this was also brought up at this little instant kangaroo court, and uh, I was accused of allowing my wife to do that and uh, being disrespectful myself, and they removed me as an elder on the basis of the testimony of two witnesses. Well, I appealed this decision, and the, uh, the society uh, sent an appeals committee into the congregation. And also the district overseer uh, came to my rescue. The district overseer was uh, apparently no friend of the circuit overseer, and he came back in and had a special meeting with the elders and the circuit overseer and told them they had to put me back on as an elder, whether they liked it or not. Well, this went back and forth. Uh, the appeals committee came up from Rhode Island. They were uh, three elderly witnesses, businessmen, respect, respectable men who owned their own businesses in Rhode Island, and they would come up to Massachusetts and meet with us every weekend, and a long line of witnesses were waiting to testify. And this went on for week after week after week, as all these grown-up men sat down to discuss a half an inch of hair. Well, it, it, what happened was that the witnesses who came to the meetings, uh, many of them started bringing up things about the other elders rather than about me. And, uh, they were saying, well, you know, Brother So-and-so, who's accusing Brother Reed, um, his wife wears slit skirts up to here, and his daughter does, and uh, and, and that, then they started making accusations against some of the other elders. And the special committee began turning it into an investigation of the other elders rather than myself. But they talked to the service representative of the service department in Brooklyn, and at that point the service department in Brooklyn told them to just reverse everything, remove Brother Reed, uh, show your support for the other elders and cancel the whole thing out. So that's what happened. They took me off as an elder and uh, uh, built up the other brothers. But this whole process took a period of many months, and we went back and forth through the whole thing. Uh, not only did we have dealings with the circuit overseer and the district overseer, but also the uh, governing body. Uh, they began answering some of the letters I wrote to them personally, and I got a letter from Jack Barr on the governing body and a letter from Carl Klein 
And both of these men in their letters revealed themselves to be organizational men rather than godly men. And that's what we began to find. The higher up we went in the organization, the more concerned they were about the organization's rules and regulations rather than scripture. Now, in the meantime, uh, my wife and I were going to the Kingdom Hall meetings through all of this. The congregation was uh, in quite a state of turmoil. People were unhappy with what was going on. People were with, unhappy with the elders. There were many people in the congregation writing to Brooklyn. And in the meantime, the other elders were getting up in front of the congregation and giving talks, uh, implying that Penny and I hated God. They didn't use our names in these talks, but they implied that I was following the lead of homosexuals and that Penny was following the lead of lesbians. And uh, they used some very strong language in denouncing us. We even had uh, talks tape recorded and played back to the circuit and district overseer, and the district overseer would force a brother to go up and give the same talk again differently. Uh, it was really ridiculous, but it reached the point during the congregation meetings where it became very difficult for us to go to those meetings, especially for Penny. She felt it, I think, the emotional hostility more so than I did. And I remember one time we were singing the song in the songbook, song number 39 in the old songbook. It's number 70 in the new book, uh, Be Like Jeremiah. And in the course of that song, part of the lyrics said, Though they will fight against you using all their wicked power, they won't prevail against you, for you will be an iron tower. And I remembered that it was the corrupt kings and priests of Israel that were the ones who were fighting against Jeremiah, the ones we were singing about. And I sort of identified with that because I realized that this was Jehovah's organization at that time that was persecuting Jeremiah. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah was, was treated terribly, and it was the uh, corrupt kings and priests of Israel that were doing this to him. So I began to realize that God could deal personally with individuals uh, and not necessarily always through an organization. I remember that Jeremiah was actually called disloyal and uh, the words that would have been called today an apostate. That's how they characterized him. And he was jailed and thrown into a cistern to die. Uh, today he would have been disfellowshipped by that organization. But Jehovah God was with Jeremiah, I realized, as a witness, and not with the organization at that time. So I knew that the Watchtower said that you couldn't be loyal to God unless you were loyal to the organization. But just from singing that song and reading the Bible, I knew that that wasn't so, because uh, Jeremiah wasn't the only case of an individual who stood up against a corrupt organization. For example, Eli was high priest in Israel when Samuel was a little boy. And Eli's sons were ministering as priests in the sanctuary of Jehovah in Jerusalem. Or not, it wasn't in Jerusalem at that time. But uh, Eli's sons, the priests, were robbing people of their sacrifices, and they were sleeping with the women who served at the tabernacle. And this was God's organization at that time. Well, what did God do? He spoke judgments against that corrupt organization through a little boy named Samuel. So by reading these things, I began to realize it could be possible that God's organization could be corrupt and that God could use individuals. But then in September of 1981, I saw something that really startled me. Uh, this is when the Watchtower Society reversed their disfellowshipping policy. Now, I had been around long enough to remember that the new truths that were introduced in the September 15, 1981 Watchtower were the same things that we were formally taught back in the 1960s and 1970s, before the 1974 Watchtower of August 1st came out with new truths. So the new truths we got in 1981 reversed the new truths we got in 1974 and brought us back to the pre-1974 teachings that we had rejected. Now that sounds sort of complicated, but in very practical terms, we knew that there were people in the congregation who didn't see certain friends or relatives before 1974. And when the August 15th, August 1st, rather, 1974 Watchtower came out, it told them that it was unchristlike uh, to refuse to see disfellowshipped relatives and that it was unchristlike to refuse to say hello to a disfellowshipped relative or a disfellowshipped uh, witness. And we were given an example, I remember, in the congregation. Uh, they said that 
brothers have driven past a sister who has disfellowshipped. Her car broke down in the snow, and she's got small children, and she's stuck in the snow with small children. She's trying to come to the Kingdom Hall to show that she's repentant, but she's still disfellowshipped. And the brothers would just drive past her, and no one would help her because she was a disfellowshipped person. And we were told from the platform that this was the wrong way to treat a disfellowshipped person. Now, that's what we were taught in 1974. But now in the September 15th, 1981 Watchtower, we learned that that was the right way to treat a disfellowship person. We were told to go back to that old view. Now, they didn't tell us, remember in 1974 when we changed this? Well, we're going back to it. They didn't do it that way. They just announced it as, uh, this is the thing to do. We have to stop talking to disfellowship people. We have to stop allowing disfellowship relatives into the home. And we have to go back to treating them the way that we used to. Well, I realized the society was really returning to this old point of view, and it wasn't just an academic thing. We had close friends whose lives were going to be changed by this. Uh, we had a, a dear friend whose daughter was going to have to be cut off now. Uh, she wasn't going to be able to see her daughter, and naturally nobody else in the congregation could. So it was a very serious thing to those of us who knew the impact of these changes. But evidently, other people also realized the society was returning to a former point of view because in the December 1st, 1981 Watchtower, they made this statement on page 27. They said, at times, explanations given by Jehovah's Visible Organization have shown adjustments seemingly to previous points of view, but this has not actually been the case. So they were evidently responding to word that they had heard from others. We didn't write to them because we had already had this whole series of correspondence, but evidently others had written to them telling them, hey, you're going back to what you taught before. So they came out and said, no, we're not. We didn't go back to previous points of view. Well, I knew that to be a lie. My wife Penny was really upset by it. She knew that they were lying to us. They were saying they had not gone back to previous points of view when we just saw them do it in the September Watchtower. But the thing that bothered me even more in that same issue, uh, the December 1st, 1981 Watchtower, was this statement from the same page also. Uh, it said, Jehovah God has also provided his visible organization. And then it went on to say, unless we are in touch with this channel of communication that God is using, we will not progress along the road to life no matter how much Bible reading we do. Well, that really bothered me because I realized that what they were doing there was putting the organization up here and putting the Bible down here. No matter how much Bible reading you did, that wouldn't get your life. You had to be in touch with the organization. That was the important thing. So this organization was making itself more important than the Bible, and that made me quite upset. Uh, we had already tried talking to people in the congregation. They had stopped me from giving talks by that point. They had stopped Penny and me even from receiving the microphone in the audience. So I started publishing comments from the Friends underground and circulating it to Jehovah's Witnesses locally and across the country. Uh, I won't go into details on that uh, right now. I've done that before, but the result was that I was disfellowshipped for publishing this newsletter, and I found out that Jehovah's Witnesses didn't have freedom of, uh, freedom of the press. But in the meantime, in doing all this, I did some research, and I began checking into the organization. And what did I find out? Well, to my surprise, I found out that it really never was God's organization. It wasn't that it was God's organization gone corrupt. I had been fooled all along. It never really was God's organization. But this is a key concept for Jehovah's Witnesses. This is really the key concept. And it's a concept that many Christians miss when they're trying to witness to a Jehovah's Witness. People get talking about the Trinity, they get talking about uh, theology, they get talking about uh, blood transfusions and various different side issues. But unless you hit this point, you really won't get anywhere because the key concept for Jehovah's Witnesses is that they believe they're associated with God's organization. And uh, if that isn't true, then nothing else that it says is true. But if that is true, then it has tremendous authority. To prove how important that, doc that doctrine is for Jehovah's Witnesses, I'd like to quote from the Watchtower of February 15, 1983. On page 12, the Watchtower said that there were four requirements for everlasting life, and it listed one of them as follows. Quote, A third requirement is that we be associated with God's channel, 
his organization. God has always used an organization. For example, only those in the ark in Noah's day survived the flood, and only those associated with the Christian congregation in the first century had God's favor. Similarly, Jehovah is using only one organization today to accomplish his will. To receive everlasting life in the earthly paradise, we must identify that organization and serve God as part of it. So the Watchtower was making a couple of very strong claims here. First of all, they were saying that God has always used an organization. And second, they were saying to receive everlasting life, you needed to identify that organization and serve God as part of it. But notice the example that they gave. They gave an example of Noah's family surviving in the flood. And they claimed that was an organization. Well, I, I read, reread my Bible. I didn't see the organization that they belonged to. Uh, there was Noah and his three sons. Yeah, maybe the organization was called My Three Sons. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> their wives and their sons' wives. Well, that, that looked to me like a family rather than an organization. And if you look down through history, in fact, and check the society's claim, you find in the Bible that God dealt with families most of the time in the early patriarchal days rather than an organization. There was no organization. Uh, what organization did uh, Enoch belong to? Enoch walked with the true God. What organization did uh, Abraham belong to? Or Isaac? Or Jacob? None. There was no organization. And yet the Watchtower said here, uh, in this uh, issue of uh, February 15, 1983, that God has always used an organization. And they implied that this went right from the flood down through the uh, Christian congregation, that he always used an organization. In fact, the only time that God used an organization was during his dealings with the nation of Israel. Uh, and even then, Moses and the judges who ruled Israel in the early years were individuals and they led Israel through a very, very loose arrangement that was based mostly on families. But later on, the Aaronic, well, the Aaronic priesthood, of course, was highly organized. And later on, when the people of Israel insisted on it, God gave them kings uh, to rule them in a political sense, too. Now, the law covenant did organize life for the Israelites. They had 600-some-odd laws that told them what to do and what not to do. And under this framework of laws, there was the uh, kings and the Aaronic priesthood and the Levites who supported the priests. Well, the Watchtower repeatedly points to that Jewish organization as proof that God deals with Christians today through an organization. Well, if that's true, then what does the record show about this organization in ancient Israel? Actually, it shows that that arrangement didn't work. That whole arrangement didn't work. Uh, the kings became corrupt, the priests became corrupt, uh, the system of laws led to all kinds of problems, and the arrangement worked so badly that God stopped using his organization. It wasn't God's fault, it was the people's fault. And we see the whole thing explained to us in Hebrews chapter 8, beginning at verse 7. And it explains there that though God did have an organization, he stopped using it. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8, beginning at verse 7. And it says, beginning at verse 7, For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, it will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or his brother saying, Know the Lord because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, I will, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. 
Well, by going back to an organization for God to deal with people, uh, the Watchtower has really gone back to something that's obsolete. The old covenant, the organization that God used, was obsolete. He said, uh, most of this is quoting from uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, and the writer of Hebrews quotes from that, showing that God foretold that he would abandon that arrangement of the old covenant and make a new covenant. And the new covenant would be different from the old covenant. He said it wouldn't be like the old covenant. It would be different. It would be based on individuals not being taught to know God, because each one in the new covenant would know God and he would forgive their sins. Well, of course, we know that the new covenant is through Jesus Christ. And the difference is that we don't join an organization, but through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we actually come to know God personally. So the new covenant fo focuses on an individual, not on an organization. Uh, Jesus said at John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So the truth is not an organization. The truth is Jesus. When we used to say we were in the truth because we were in the Watchtower organization, that was blasphemy. Because Jesus is the truth, not any organization. But that old covenant served a number of useful purposes, and God naturally had this in mind when he arranged that old covenant. The old covenant was a tutor leading to Christ. And it also taught a number of lessons about human behavior, especially in religious organizations. Take your Bible sometime and review the record of that old organization. The, the New Testament says that all this was recorded for our benefit. And if we read it, we'll find that the kings of Israel were terrible. The or political organization didn't function well. Most of them were unfaithful. The priests weren't much better. The religious aspect of the organization didn't work. Uh, and Jeremiah was far from the only individual that God's organization of that time persecuted. In fact, God kept sending individuals to rebuke the organization. If you read the Old Testament, you'll see that that happened over and over and over again, that the organization, uh, with its headquarters eventually in Jerusalem, was unfaithful, and God kept sending individuals to go to that organization and tell them how unfaithful they were. In fact, concerning the Jerusalem organization, though, um, the Watchtower claims that this pictured or prefigured their own organization in many ways. But what did Jesus say about that organization in Jerusalem, God's organization? Jesus said uh, in Matthew 23, verse 37, he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. So that's how God's organization reacted to the individuals that God sent to rebuke that corrupt organization. And when the Son of God himself was sent to rebuke the organization, what did it do? Well, it formed a special committee, special judicial committee. It declared him an apostate and it crucified him. So no wonder God quit using his organization. But didn't Jesus set up a new organization? This is what the Watchtower claims, that Jesus really set up a new earthly organization to replace the old one, and that the Watchtower is the continuation of it. Well, let's look at uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24, and it'll tell us whether a new organization was needed or not. Uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24. We'll see whether we need and whether a new uh, earthly organization was needed. In Hebrews 7, verse 24, it says, But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Going on to verse 25, Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. So there would be no need for another organization. Jesus himself can save completely all those who come to God through him. Because he's always alive. He doesn't need to have an organization take his place. He is here, and he can do it. So we have Jesus. We don't need an organization. Besides, as we learned from ancient Israel, organizations don't work. In fact, you can look at the history of Christianity and see that, because the Watchtower was not the only group that tried to set up an organization uh, to continue to function as in the Old Testament. Every time Christians have even gotten together and formed a powerful religious organization, 
That organization's gone corrupt. Just look at the history of the Christian church. The Christian organizations that have gained great power have always ended up condemning innocent people and even putting people to death. Look at the history of Europe. Look at the bloody Inquisition when the church was uh, burning people at the stake, torturing people. Uh, look at the history of uh, the wars in Europe. Most of these were fought over, or many of them were fought over religious power with one religious organization leading the people against another. Uh, in Massachusetts, where I come from, uh, Massachusetts was originally considered to be a theocratic government. Uh, the theocracy that ruled Massachusetts under the Puritans who first settled the colony, uh, that religious organization in Massachusetts was notorious for conducting the Salem witch trials where innocent people were forced to make confessions and were, were killed under torture. Uh, the theocratic government of Massachusetts also burned uh, or hanged Quakers. Uh, when we had our friends, uh, the Coonies, visiting us from England last week, we went to uh, Boston and visited the State House uh, in Massachusetts and uh, Massachusetts State House, and right out in front of the Capitol, there's a statue of Mary Dyer, and it says underneath it that she was hanged for being a Quaker. She was hanged on Boston Common by the theocratic government of Massachusetts. They didn't use the word theocratic, but so uh, history tells us a lot about organizations, and we can today look at the shame that's been brought on the name of Christ through organizations such as that of uh, Jim and Tammy Baker and uh, Jimmy Swaggart. It seems that whenever you have uh, organizations that accumulate great power and great amounts of money, and the leadership positions uh, involve controlling great power and great money, it seems that these organizations attract to their leadership positions corrupt men, uh, the same way a pile of manure attracts flies. You know, if you offer a position, uh, it, it may be a very godly man who sets up a religious organization, and he's its leader. When he passes and a position becomes vacant, and they're offering fifty or sixty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars a year to fill that position, well, does that mean that just godly men are going to line up for that position? Well, obviously not. I mean, there, there are going to be quite a few people who are looking for the money. Now, in the Watchtower, it's not usually money; it's power. But we know that power equals money. A person who has great power uh, has the same feeling as a person who has great money because money allows you to spend it and acquire power. They're, they're basically equivalent. Uh, a case in point is found in the recent situation where the Watchtower went to court to support Jimmy Swaggart. The Watchtower is very embarrassed about this. I mean, they haven't mentioned it in any of their publications, unfortunately. But uh, the Watchtower Society did file a friend of the court brief in the court of Jimmy Swaggart, trying to help him win his court case before the United States Supreme Court. Well, why did they do it? Why did they suddenly drop all their hostility to Babylon the Great and false religion and declare themselves a friend of the court and filing a brief in Swaggart's case? They did this in the summer of 1990, or rather in, in 1989. Uh, they did this because there were millions of dollars involved. Jimmy Swaggart was fighting the government over the California sales tax, and the Watchtower realized that whatever way the government went in Swaggart's case was going to affect the Watchtower religious uh, literature sales in California. So the Watchtower Society filed a legal brief to defend Jimmy Swaggart before the Supreme Court. Uh, the details of all of this are documented in the summer 1990 issue of Comments from the Friends, if you haven't seen them. But the reason the Watchtower did this was because of the money involved. And, of course, when Swaggart lost his case, the Watchtower Society reversed its policy on literature distribution, and instead of uh, asking for a specific amount of money, now Jehovah's Witnesses everywhere are asking for contributions, and they've got a new truth on account of Jimmy Swaggart. <laughs> now, down through history, some religious organizations truly have advanced the cause of Christianity, but some have done just the opposite. The real Christian church, though, is not any earthly organization. It's the one referred to at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23. And if you're coming out of the watchtower and looking for the true church, uh, this is where you can find it. It's, in, it's referred to in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23. In Hebrews 12, verse 23, it says, 
that you have approached the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. So this is the true church. It's the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. It's not an earthly organization. It's a heavenly organization. But didn't Jesus set up an earthly organization? The Watchtower is always pointing to it. Didn't he organize his disciples? Yes, at one point Jesus sent out 12 as apostles, and then later on he sent out 70, sent them out two by two. So he was organizing his disciples. But did that mean that he was setting up an earthly organization that we would have to identify with and serve God as part of that organization in order to be saved? Well, Jesus himself really answered that when people asked him about it. People asked him about people who weren't part of his organization. In Mark chapter 9, verse 38 to 41, Jesus gives the answer as to whether you have to be part of that organization to be saved. Uh, Mark chapter 9, the, the apostles thought you did. The apostles thought you had to be part of the organization. But uh, let's see how Jesus answered it in Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 41. Uh, John was actually the one who brought it up in verse 38. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. So this fellow wasn't part of the organization. He wasn't part, he wasn't going around with Jesus and the apostles. He was off somewhere else and he heard about Jesus and he was trying to cast out demons using Jesus' name. And John was offended by this because this man wasn't part of their organization. Well, let's look how Jesus answered him in verse 39. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. So Jesus made it quite clear, even though John thought you had to be part of the organization, Jesus said, no, you don't have to as long as you're not against us. In fact, if you just give a cup of cold water to a disciple, you won't learn, that person won't lose his reward. And we certainly know Jesus was telling the truth about that. Well, Jesus wasn't the only one who thought or who said that you didn't need an organization, an earthly organization. Uh, the Watchtower's founder, Pastor Russell, was of the same opinion. And if you look back in the Watchtower magazine, they made a number, he made a number of statements about organizations. And in the early days of the Watchtower, it wasn't really what you'd call an organization. It was a publishing group. They were publishing literature that was distributed pretty much by people who were part of other churches or other religious groups or uh, they didn't really have to join an organization or anything. It was, it was no big thing. And if you look back in the Watchtower in uh, March of 1883 on page 458 in the Society's reprints, Russell said this. He said, We believe that a visible organization and the adoption of some particular name would tend to increase our numbers and make us more respectable in the estimation of the world. And then he added, but we always refuse to be called by any other name than that of our head, Christians. So Russell felt that uh, setting up an organization would make them more appealing to the world, but he didn't want to do that. And in the September 1st, 1983 Watchtower, on page 1572 in the reprints, it says, in essence, that there is no organization today clothed with authority. In other words, no organization with authority from God. In the December 1st, 19, or rather 1894 Watchtower, on page 1743 in the reprints, it actually said that a visible organization would be out of harmony with God's divine plan. And in the... Um, well, those are, those are three of the primary quotes. Oh, there's one other one. Um, September 15th, 1895, on page 1866, the Watchtower said, and this is a direct quote, Beware of organization. It is wholly unnecessary. So that was the opinion of the Watchtower Society and its writers back in the late 1800s. They gave some very strong warnings against organization. Now, it's true that the New Testament does reveal that God's will is for Christians to meet in fellowship. We're not to just go isolate ourselves. Uh, John the Baptist lived by himself in the wilderness and ate the wild locusts, but that wasn't an example that all of us were supposed to follow. But God's will was for Christians to meet together and to fellowship together and to share the Lord's Supper together. And so it's important for us to follow this arrangement. 
God organized Christians as congregations. And the Lord blesses this arrangement with gifts in men that he gives to these congregations to build them up. But what about the Watchtower's claim that there's some central authority, that their governing body corresponds somehow to the twelve apostles and older men in Jerusalem? Well, this is an interesting claim that the Watchtower makes. Uh, they make this claim in a number of different places. They make it in the, the Life Everlasting in Paradise on Earth book, and they make it in many different places. They've repeated it over the years, that their governing body corresponds to the twelve apostles and elders in Jerusalem. Well, the best place to disprove that claim is to turn to a book called Reasoning from the Scriptures, put out by the Watchtower Society. Because on page 37 of that book, they disprove the idea that the apostles have any successors. They have a heading there called Apostolic Succession, and it gives a definition. It says uh, as follows. This is a direct quote from Reasoning from the Scriptures, page 37. They say that apostolic succession is, quote, the doctrine that the twelve apostles have successors to whom authority has been passed by divine appointment, not a Bible teaching. So they very definitely state that there are no successors to the twelve apostles. Nobody has been given that kind of central authority. And, of course, the uh, record that the Watchtower has made over the years proves that even if there were some central authority, it definitely isn't them. Uh, other speakers have gone into this. I won't do it now, but uh, we've seen the false prophecies the Watchtower has made over the years, the back-and-forth changes in doctrine, uh, the deceptions. All of these things prove that even if there were a God's organization on earth today, it wouldn't be the Watchtower. So if you've been trying to get everlasting life by identifying God's organization and serving as part of it, forget it. You don't need any organization. All you need is Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29, Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are tired from carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and put it on you and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in spirit and you will find rest. So Jesus said, come to me, not come to an organization. And unlike so many organizations, Jesus added at John verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 37, I will never turn away anyone who comes to me. So come to Jesus, not an organization.